1959 general election was widely predicted as being too close to call. In fact, it was a complete walkover. The Conservatives won the night and increased their majority to 100 seats. I turned out to be the runner-up in the Guardian election sweepstake by predicting a Conservative win with a bare majority of 30. None of us got it right. The Conservative victory is credited to the economic situation and to the increase in wages, but also to their secret weapon, to Supermac himself. Witty, pragmatic and unflappable, Howard Millen's life is the subject of a new biography by Charles Williams, a Labour peer who joins Mark Darcy now for a special edition of Book Talk. Welcome to Book Talk. Every now and then, British politics throws up a magician, a political leader with that rare ability to transform the scene, someone who's mastered the alchemy which turns base politics into electoral gold. Perhaps Tony Blair was one, certainly David Lloyd George was, and so was Harold Macmillan, the subject of a new biography by my guest today, Charles Williams, Lord Williams. And Lord Williams, the thing about Harold Macmillan was that somehow or other he had a, a magical ability to sort of sense the mood of the country and communicate with it, until one day that magical ability seemed to desert him altogether. Up to a point. It wasn't one day, it gradually went. I think between 1957, when he became Prime Minister, and 1962, he had got that popular touch and was in um, communication with the broad mood of the country. But that went slightly sour and um, all sorts of things started to go wrong and he couldn't really retrieve that before the disasters of 1963. Well, he, he was, as you say, for a time at least, the, the great political showman. You remember the, the, that famous session of the United Nations where Nikita Khrushchev is banging his shoe during a Macmillan speech and Macmillan just sort of rather lordly, looks round and dem uh, asks politely for a translation. Asks for a translation, yes. And yes. there's, the, of course, the, 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 one of the most famous sound bites of all time, you've never had it so good, which perhaps was a bit of a hostage to fortune. Well, oddly enough, the new never had it so good was a warning. It wasn't uh, Macmillan saying, you're all very well off. He was saying, can this possibly last? And that's interesting with Macmillan. It came across as a great sound bite which was quoted and quoted and quoted and was super Mac in the 1959 election. But in fact, it was a warning. You know, we're not quite sure this can last. So there was a caution there as well as the soundbite. But as you, as you reveal in the, in the book, when you, when you look back at the young Harold Macmillan, the, the young Conservative MP who had served in the trenches and been wounded there, the impression you get is not of a, a sort of embryo great communicator. You get the impression of a, a rather strange young man who sort of lecture young ladies on high political theory at dinner parties. Yeah, I mean, he was a bore in the 1920s and 1930s. He used to empty the House of Commons smoking room whenever he walked in and used to tell laborious jokes which fell flat and people used to say, well, this chap's going to go nowhere. Um, and then he resigned the Tory whip, uh, could only retrieve it after some you know, clawing back. So he was not a political figure in certainly up to 1939 and 40. Was it um, social insecurity behind all this? Because although he was an old Etonian and although he came from a family that was quite wealthy, he was only a generation or so away from Scottish crofter forebears. I think the Scottish crofter forebears have been slightly overemphasised by the Macmillanites. Uh, he was, after all, um, in a publishing firm. His grandfathers were publishers. He was... Um, extremely well-educated, upper-middle-class, Eton and Balliol. So I don't think there was any problem about the social standing. Also, he'd married a, a Cavendish. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, um, the marriage went wrong. Um, his wife famously had this long affair with one of his colleagues in the House of Commons, which damaged him enormously, uh, to the point where he almost, I mean, at one point threatened suicide, and was shut up by his mother in a, a, a sanatorium in Munich. Uh, so during the 1930s, he was still really recovering from what was a very, very unpleasant experience. I mean, imagine going into the House of Commons uh, 
and hearing all the sniggers. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. The king knew and he said, we've got to keep it quiet. Everybody knows. You walk into the House of Commons, which, as you know, is a very tightly knit place. You, don't, you can't escape. And the sniggers, oh, well, poor old Harold. He's, uh, he's in trouble with his wife. And there was no question of divorce. He didn't want to give her a divorce. Um, Boothby didn't want to marry her anyway. Um, so recovering from all that and getting through all that um, had, in my view, t two effects. First of all, it toughened him up. Mm. Was, it, was it the making of Mamela's in, in a that sense, sense, strange way? Well, in that sense, it toughened him up. And uh, he, he decided that he was going to be a real politician instead of a slightly donnish dilettante. And the, the chance for him to, to make his impact in real politics was around the outbreak of the Second World War. He was one of the group of young-ish Conservative MPs who, who were, to some extent, aligned with Churchill, was certainly questioning Neville Chamberlain's appeasement policy. Well, well that's true, but he, he didn't really reap the reward for any of that. Apart from that, he rather mistakenly decided that maybe he wanted a rather bigger job than... Churchill was prepared to give him in May 1940, um, partly because he was still a bit footloose in his, his views. And um, his period, the Minister of Supply and the Colonial Office, were they were all right, but you couldn't say that this is somebody destined to start them. And it wasn't until he got to North Africa... Which was a bit accidental, in a which way. Which he was third choice for. Um, but when he got to North Africa in January 1943, that was the point at which his whole personality and career burgeoned. And th this, was, this was where he was, in effect, operating, governing by decree on behalf of Britain in, in North Africa? Very much so, after the torch landings, North African landings, um, when North Africa was, had been uh, taken by the Americans and the British, and there was a question then whether they should go to... Italy or the Second Front in France, there was the Casablanca conference, and so on and so forth. And, and he was regarded as a sort of pro-consul in the Mediterranean. And he did it very well. And, it, and this, is, it seems, is the moment that he was somewhat catapulted forward to, towards, at least, the front rank of Conservative politics. Very much so. And when he came back after the war, uh, he was expecting to become Secretary of State for Defence under the new... Churchill government um, and uh, in 1951 when the new Churchill government came to power he was told by Churchill that he, Churchill, was going to be Minister of Defence, Secretary of State of Defence and Macmillan was going to become Minister of Housing. He knew nothing about housing at all. But even so, it, it, it was the making of him as a public figure. It there. was the making of him as a public figure. He was, um, again, this is a, an interesting illustration of picking winners. He lit on Ernest Marples as the junior minister in the Ministry of Housing. And Marples, for all his rather curious, eccentric, um, sartorial behaviour, blue suits and suede shoes, which the Tories didn't like at all, he was an efficient operator. He'd actually run a business. And Marples did basically all the work of building all these houses and Macmillan took all the credit, reasonably enough. So that was deliberate and great political skill. And we see this, this onward and upward ministerial progress uh, to the point where he eventually becomes a, a rival to the succession when Anthony Eden is prime minister. And, well, ultimately gets that. But you, you're in the book, you're, you're pretty hostile to him. I mean, you remark fairly regularly on Macmillan being duplicitous and ambitious and clambering over the prone bodies of various colleagues. Um, why the hostility? You, you, you don't seem to regard him as a national treasure in the way that a lot of people do. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm wholly hostile. I recognise that politically he had become a class act. Um, many of his speeches were brilliant and all sorts of... The, the way he handled his colleagues was extremely clever. Where I think he was ruthless was in elbowing out his competitors and um, I think some of his competitors suffered rather badly from the elbows. Yes well I mean the, the obvious one is, is Rab Butler his great rival who's 
yeah, as he was climbing up the ladder, Rab Butler always seemed to be ever so slightly or quite a lot yeah. senior to him. Yeah. But somehow Rab Butler, although he was always the crown prince, never got the crown and Macmillan dead. Well, that's right. And Is that's... it because Macmillan wanted it more? I think um, it was because, partly because Rab uh, uh, was not perhaps as um, quite as personally ambitious as Macmillan, who by then had become personally very ambitious. And partly because Rab had a slight streak of intellectual indolence in him and was not prepared to grab the, the, the crown when it was obviously uh, on offer. And Macmillan certainly was there to grab the crown. Uh, and he grabbed the crown in the wake of the Suez debacle. The government's foreign policy was in shreds. The relationship with America was in tatters. And he had the job of trying to rebuild its credibility and did so brilliantly. That's where he comes into his own. Mm. Um, although I argue that on the excuses for Suez and how he elbowed Rab out of the way um, and almost elbowed Eden out of the way over Suez and told this story about run on the pound, which um, isn't really not supported by the evidence. In spite of that, when he became prime minister, he had a brilliant period. And, and, and indeed, between 1957 and through 59 and to 62, I think I would argue that he was not only a, one of the foremost prime ministers of the 20th century, but could possibly be regarded as a great prime minister. Bringing things right up to date, Harold Macmillan is, is now cited as a sort of forebear to David Cameron's approach. You know, is David Cameron, in a way, a, a, a modern uh, Macmillan, complete with Old Etonian cabinet? Well, um, David Cameron was not born in the reign of Queen Victoria, for a start, and David Cameron does not sport a moustache. Macmillan was the last British prime minister to sport a moustache, and that is mm. indicative. Uh, there's no doubt that David Cameron has the um, intellectual ability that Macmillan had. Macmillan was one of the most intelligent, clever, intellectually prominent prime ministers of the 20th century. No doubt about that. And Cameron is no doubt intellectually right. Now, whether David Cameron has the p same political skills in the current context that Macmillan had in the context of the 1950s is not for me to say. It's more you've never had it so bad at the moment. You've never had it so good, I suppose. But, Williams, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Book Talk will be back again soon. Join us then. Lord Williams Melville talking to our own Mark Darcy about his new biography of Harold Macmillan. The 1959 general election was perhaps the most materialistic yet. It also marked, of course, the high watermark of post-war consensus conservatism that has come to be identified with Harold Macmillan and his mollifying number two, R.A. Butler. Edges in politics would get much more jagged in the non-conformist years to come, with the coming of the permissive society, the arrival of the Beatles, and the rise of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. The 1950s may have been a predominantly docile decade, but the 1960s was to prove a much more rebellious one, in which a new generation began to question even the values on which they had been brought up. Was prosperity itself enough? And should society aspire to be something else as well as being affluent? The coming decade might not give a definitive answer to such questions, but at least it posed them which is more than can be said for the last election of the 1950s, when Mammon reigned supreme. Good night. What do you want if you don't want money? What do you want if you don't want gold? Say what you want and we'll give it to you, darling. Wish you wanted my love, baby.